So good morning everybody, welcome to Mindset Monday. My name's Sally Garozzo and this is the place to be to get inspiration and motivation on how to be happier and more fulfilled. So today is part one of a three-part series called Reprogram Your Mind for Weight Loss. So this is for you if you're the kind of person that really cannot stop thinking about food. So if you obsess about cakes, if you obsess about chocolate, if you're always thinking about it, if it's in the house and you can't stop thinking about it, or if you walk past cafes and you're like, oh my God, I just want that, I want that. If you're always thinking about food or cakes or junk food, this is for you. It's also for you if you are just sick of the dieting, yo-yo dieting bandwagon. If you've been on it and off it more times than you've had hot dinners. <laughs> um, because diets don't work. They program you for failure. They, they don't work because they go against nature. They're all about deprivation. They're all about pain and your mind is programmed to move you away from pain. So that's why they eventually fail. So this is for you if you're sick of that process. I know I was sick of it too. Um, and this is for you if you are ready for some new ideas, new thoughts, new thinking around weight, why weight is there in the first place. And maybe you have a hunch that it's something to do with stress and something to do with underlying emotions that you are not expressing. So this brings me nicely on to today's title, which is it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. So what I would like you to do if you're watching this and you've got time, um, grab a notebook, grab a pen, because we will be doing a little exercise later on. So remember, this is a three-part series. This is part one, and it's, it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. So... There's a field of study called epigenetics. Uh, let me know if you've heard of it or not heard of it. You should really go and check it out. Bruce Lipton is the guy. Um, so epigenetics points to the fact that it's really all about your environment. So your internal and external, but mainly your internal environment um, is more important than your genetics, than your genetic coding. So your environment can actually switch on and switch off certain genes, okay? So just because a parent has had a disease, an illness or cancer, for example, it doesn't mean to say that you are going to get it. What's more important is the environment. Now we know that our thinking and our thoughts really do affect our internal environment, okay? so. Our thinking can either promote health or regeneration of our cells, or our thinking can either pr can promote disease or degeneration of our cells. So that is why I love RTT. That's why I love the therapy that I do, because it works with your thinking, which in turn works with your feelings, okay? And it's all about feelings, thinking, feelings, they are kind of interlinked. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking will feed a feeling. And whatever you're feeling, the brain needs to interpret so it creates a story around the feeling. And when we work in RTT, we can uncover, because it's done under hypnosis, it works with the subconscious mind, we can uncover programming um, that reveals certain programming that you've got inside of you that might be creating an environment within yourself that is causing your body to hold on to weight, might be causing you to hold on to disease, might be causing you to act out certain behaviors, okay? And the subconscious mind is so powerful because it's linked to your emotions. Your conscious mind is linked to logic, okay? So when we feel stuff emotionally, that is when we get leverage to change, okay? When we know something logically, we don't have as much leverage to change at all because 95% of your drivers and your processes 
happen subconsciously, okay? So you don't have any control over those things. They are deep, deep, deep programs that have usually been created during childhood. So trying to logic your problems away, which is what dieting does, is absolutely ludicrous because it's only using 5% of your, of your mind, of your brain. And it's too much effort, basically. <laughs> so it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. So most of us do use food as a way of avoiding feeling certain feelings, okay? Whether it's boredom, whether it's stress, whether it's loneliness, whether it's anxiety, or whether it's just to bring ourselves back to a feeling of being in our body, because a lot of people who experience weight issues are empaths, and they're always kind of feeling the world around them. And so eating is a way of grounding you, of bringing your energy back to you, rather than thinking about other people, worrying about other people all of the time. So in essence, eating to soothe yourself is okay, we all do it. We did it when we were a baby, when we were on the boob. That's what we did, we felt safe, we felt secure. It's all okay until it starts getting out of control and st until it starts affecting your physical health and your mental health. So I want to tell you about a scientific study to underpin the point that I'm making. So there's this brilliant guy, I talk about him a lot, he's called Johan Hari, and he wrote a book called Lost Connections, which is actually a book about depression. Now I bet you might be thinking, what has a book about depression got to do with weight? Turns out, everything, right? So in his book, he talks about a study that Dr. Vincent Felitti did, and Dr. Vincent Felitti worked for a massive corporation corporation and they wanted to find out why on earth their sales were plummeting and they believed it was because it was linked to um, obesity. Basically obesity was getting in the way of their sales and what Felitti discovered was absolutely pivotal. So because he had loads of money obviously, um, Felitti was given absolute free reign and with his inquiring mind he designed a trial that would find out what would happen if a group of clinically obese people actually got down to their normal weight. What would happen to them mentally? Would they be happier or not? So for example, is the weight giving them something? And what Felitti discovered that um, basically if you give an overweight person all the water and nutrients they need via supplementation and nothing else, they would lose around 300 pounds in one year, which is quite a lot. And the patients that took part in this trial had tried everything, they were willing, they were up for anything, they were 100% committed. And after a few months, it looked like the patients were regaining their health and vitality. They were definitely more mobile, and Dr. Felitti thought he had cracked it. Until something happened. Hang on. So this is a quote from his book, the people who did the best and lost the most weight were often thrown into a brutal depression or panic or rage. They often became suicidal. Without their bulk, they couldn't cope. They felt unbelievably vulnerable. They often fled the program, gorged on fast food and put the weight back on really, really quickly. It was absolutely baffling. Why did these people who were heading in the right direction of losing the weight, feeling very healthy in their bodies, why did they want to sabotage all of their hard work and go back to this old way of eating? And Felitti was genuinely concerned, so he spent a lot of time talking to his patients and asking them how, he, how they felt when they lost all this weight. And he spoke to one lady who said that when she was big, nobody ever hit on her, no men ever hit on her. But when she got down to a healthy weight, one day this guy who she knew was married propositioned her and it made her feel extremely vulnerable and she fled the program and began to eat right away. Now, this is really interesting because according to Marissa Peer and the work that I do in RTT, every symptom 
that you have, even if you don't want it, is actually giving you something. Because your body and your mind is always working for you to protect you or to give you what you think it needs, okay? Now, it turns out that people who are holding on to excess weight are doing so in order to appear unattractive. So to them, it is better to be unattractive than to be sexy, attractive, um, get attention, all of those things. So we have to look at where on earth does that come from? And usually it comes from, comes from around this deep rooted trauma that something bad happened to them, possibly for being attractive, maybe for being sexy, maybe just for being who they were. Now, this is a sad fact that it's all too common that the link between sexual abuse and some kind of sexual dysfunction and weight gain is all too common. Okay, and I, I see it quite a bit in my practice. But Dr. Felitti discovered that there was a direct link between when the patient started to put weight on and something tragic or traumatic that was happening or some kind of stress that was happening to them that might have been a trigger for other old wounds, but also was triggering something within them that really needed to be looked at. Um, and maybe they didn't want to feel it because feelings can get in the way of life, right? You know, you want to, you need to get on with stuff. You've got stuff to do. Often we don't have time to be breaking down or to, you know, give ourselves time to process difficult emotions and this is the problem. This is the problem with the way that the world is set up today, but things are changing. Now, evidence does suggest that unless you get to the root, unless you really, really deeply understand what on earth is going on with you emotionally, psychologically, unless you get to the root, that weight will keep coming back no matter how hard you try to lose weight with dieting, etc. So, I'm gonna give you a little metaphor to underpin my point because the subconscious mind loves a picture. So I want you to imagine that there's a house on fire, all right, maybe a, a bungalow or something, and you can see all of this smoke billowing from the roof, and it would be very, very easy to think that the smoke was the problem because it's way more visible than the fire itself. But thank goodness, that the fire department know they need to put out the fire inside, all right, because it's that that is causing the smoke. The fire department don't come along and start wafting the smoke away, all right, because that is that would make the, that would stoke the fire, wouldn't it, right? And this is what diets do. Diets try to blow the smoke away. They don't address the fire underneath. Basically, diets just fan the flames even more, all right? So I want you to think of the weight as the, as the smoke, not the fire. There's something underneath the weight that is um, causing it, just like the fire is causing the smoke. So address the smoke, which is the weight, by putting out the fire. That's what I'm trying to say. I hope you can get your head around that. So the fire is the emotional trauma and the smoke is the weight, like the symptom. Any, it could be any symptom, it could be whatever. So Dr. Felitti realized that all of the weight reduction programs usually focused on what to eat. But patients or people who have weight issues know what to eat. They know that they need to eat more protein, more fruit, more vegetables, less carbohydrates, more good fats. Um, they don't need to know that. What they need is for somebody to understand why they are eating, why that fire is there causing this smoke. So it's very, very interesting. So in RTT, in the therapy that I do, what we do is go back to scenes in your childhood under hypnosis to try to understand where this relationship to food or where this relationship to your body image or sense of identity or sense of self started to get disrupted. We need to understand where it came from because understanding is power. And understanding, especially in hypnosis, is incredibly powerful because it enables this clarity. When you have this clarity, you can see it so 
clearly and then you can go well that's silly because that's not me now or you can give the feelings that have been squashed or suppressed over the years you can give them a chance to be aired but then you can decide to do things differently so it's really really interesting that all children are actually in hypnosis and that was you once when you were a child you were in hypnosis your brain waves were buzzing around around theta and when you are a kid, when you're in hypnosis, you are incredibly receptive to the language, to the behaviors, to the patterns, to the teachings of the adults around you. You literally believe anything that is going on around you, but you can also be made to feel very wrong about certain feelings that you're feeling. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to go back and to see how you were programmed because some of these interactions can cause problems later on in life. So I'm just gonna read some statements that I've written down, um, uh, some things that I've heard in my life, some things that some of my clients have heard in their life about um, weight and about food. So some of the things you might hear is hurry up and finish your breakfast or you'll be late for school. That might make a person really bolt their food in adulthood because they don't want to let the adults around them down. Um, you might have heard eat your vegetables, otherwise you won't get dessert. You might have heard finish your dinner, there are starving people in Africa. You might have heard, you might have been bribed with food. So you might have heard something like, um, Mummy loves you so much, here, have a biscuit or have some ice cream or something like that. Or you might have heard something like, don't eat that sugar, don't eat that biscuit, don't eat that cake because, you know, you will, yeah, you'll, you'll get fat or you'll have a heart attack or it will mess with your brain or, you know, you can really scaremonger children into kind of not eating certain foods and when that happens it all goes horribly wrong because they believe that they are wrong and whatever you suppress will end up coming out eventually. So when we hear things, when we hear these skewed patterns around food, our feelings around food start to get disrupted and our feelings about ourselves start to get disrupted because you know children do have a very natural relationship to food and babies have very natural relationships they kind of play with their food and they eat when they're hungry and they really do stop when they've had enough you know kids just want to go off and play when they've eaten a little bit of cake or something at a party you know, they'll, they'll eat it and then they'll run off and play and you'll end up with all of this leftover food and it's normally the adults that are kind of looking at the food and then pigging out on it afterwards. So kids do not obsess over food and actually, you know, the slimmest people that I know who have naturally slim bodies, they don't think about food either. They don't obsess over it when they're hungry, they start to think about what do I fancy, they eat when they're finished, you know, eating for them has a beginning, middle and an end. So what I'm saying is, is you can very, very quickly make a baby or a child doubt their natural relationship to food, or you can make them worry about where um, the next meal is going to come from, or that their desires for certain foods are wrong. They shouldn't be desiring those things and they need to be repressed. And whatever you repress will eventually motivate you. That's why if you deny a child sugar, Eventually, as an adult, they will probably end up with a sugar addiction, which is what happened to me. Um, but you can also make them feel like food is their only comfort. Food is their only source of comfort. You know, if you, if you um, give a child lots of biscuits and associate biscuits with love, that's what's gonna happen when um, you're older. So it's really important to find out who or what disrupted this natural relationship to food by looking at the memories. And this might seem like hard work and you don't have the time to do this, but I'd say you don't have the time not to do it. If you're consistently yo-yo dieting, that's wasting a lot of time because diets don't work. And so it's really important to get to the bottom, the root, get to the fire. 
So here are some questions that I want you to ask yourself. And if you're watching the replay, by all means, stop and write some of these questions down. But I'm just going to talk them through now. And these are the sorts of things that we go into very deeply in an RTT session. So did you have a brother or a sister that used to steal your food? Did you have to fight for food when you were younger? Did you have to fill your plate and eat it very quickly? Were you teased by a brother or a sister? Were you as a child made to feel small? Were you made to feel invisible? Did mum or dad not really listen to you, not really pay that much attention to you? And is that why you have this need to be bigger? Often the weight can make people, this bulk can make you feel safe, can make you feel seen. And as a child, maybe you weren't seen. So we're like detectives putting it all together. Were you bullied at school? Often bullying can make children feel terrible about themselves, which is awful and it really shouldn't happen. We really need to teach people how not to do that, but also how to make themselves feel okay within their own skin. Because when you feel okay in your own skin, you don't need to bully, but also you won't be affected by the bully as well. And also being bullied can make you feel like you need to be bigger too. Um, or was it the opposite? Because do you feel like you need to be smaller? Because actually people who have weight tend to retreat from the world, tend to retract and pull away and retreat and be small. Do you feel like you actually were too big and you need to be, need to be smaller? And is the weight giving you, um, is it kind of preventing you from getting out into the world and shining your true beautiful self? Did you grow up with parents who had a real scarcity mindset? Was there a lack mindset? Was, this, was there this mindset that there's just not ever going to be enough food to go round? And as a result, did you program yourself when you were younger going, when I'm older, I am going to have all the cakes and sweets that I want because I couldn't have them when I was younger? Um, is the weight purposefully making you feel unattractive to avoid being sexy, because when you were younger, did being sexy or pretty or cute um, give you the attention, create attention for you that you didn't actually want, which is a very sad fact and we see it a lot. Was your eating or food choices controlled by a spouse or a partner or a parent? This might be later on in your life. Did you have a bullying partner that didn't like it when you started to eat more, didn't like you when you started to put weight on? Or were they just trying to control you? Did a parent comfort you with food? This is such an interesting one. Uh, it wasn't food, but I had a client who only felt connected to her dad when she was drinking. And that was very interesting because she just couldn't stop drinking. Was it the same with food? Did you only feel connected when you were sat around a big table, there was loads of food? Were, do you associate food with joy, pleasure, togetherness, community? Is that why you still do that today and still go and um, you know make lots of cakes for your family or have lots of dinner parties where there's just so much food? Um, and did you salivate over treats that were not allowed as a kid? This can have a massive impact um, because, like I say, when you deny a child something, they will automatically go and seek it out during their teenage years or when they are older. So whatever it is, there are so many reasons, so many, and, and it's not one size fits all. Everybody is so different. That's why you really need to see people individually for this. However, we can do an exercise, and this is what I want you guys to do. If you're watching this, if you have an issue with weight or food, or if you know somebody that does, this is a really good exercise that you can do. So first of all, I'll talk you through the process, and then we can do it together. First of all, you have to get yourself into a meditative state. You have to slow your brain waves down, close your eyes so that you have access to the subconscious mind. You can do this through meditation, through breathing, through relaxation, whatever. 
and you're going to ask your mind to take you back to a scene or a memory that's all to do with why you have the weight and why your relationship to food became disrupted. Go back to maybe one, two or three scenes and write about those scenes in your journal. What are you feeling in this situation? Try to dissect it all. Try to get back to the, the, the root program. What did you end up believing about yourself? What programs were installed about you and about food and how is that having an impact today now that you are an adult? Write it down and dive deep within that. Yes, yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Um, what did I learn about myself and about food and how might that have impacted me today? So, if you wanna do this now, let's do it. I think we'll just do it, shall we? So. What I want you to do is um, grab your notebook, have it by you and your pen. You're gonna close your eyes and you're going to breathe nice and deeply and you're going to focus on the tip of your nose as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Keep focusing on the tip of your nose as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Settling yourself down. Relaxing the muscles and nerves around your eyes. Relaxing your forehead. Relaxing your cheeks. Your tongue, your jaw. Relaxing the back of your neck. Your scalp. Relaxing your arms all the way down to your hands and your fingertips. And then sending that relaxation all the way down, 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 down your body, down into your legs, down into your feet. And imagine your body's energy coming out through your feet, traveling down through the earth wrapping around the earth's core. So you're firmly rooted, firmly grounded, tied to the earth. Just going deeper now, sinking deeper, drifting down deeper, deeper, deeper. And as you go down, drift down, travel down. I want you now to go back to a scene in your life that's all to do with why you have weight issues or why you have a distorted body image or why your relationship to food is disrupted. So just go back now and imagine a scene in your life. And look at that scene and ask yourself, what is going on in this scene? And just take some time now to write it down. Ask yourself, what's going on in this scene? What are you experiencing? What are you feeling? and allow those feelings to be felt. It's really important that we allow those feelings to be felt because maybe they've been stuck inside for a long time. Maybe they've been suppressed. Maybe that's why you eat. Ask yourself, what are you learning about food in this situation? I have to rush my food. I have to 
make sure all of the cupboards are full. I have to keep food just in case somebody comes round or pops round. I'm only safe if there's lots and lots of food in the fridge or in the cupboards. I'm only loved when I'm sitting down with my family and there's loads of food there. Or I feel sad because I can't have certain foods and I want certain foods. Everyone else is having this, this food but I'm not allowed. And that makes me feel so different. That makes me feel disconnected. And I must connect because that's a, a driver. So now I'm an adult, I eat food to connect with others. Junk food. When I say food, I mean junk food, food that's not good for you. What happened to you to create this? And so, write those things down and have a look at them. And over the next week, because I'm gonna jump on next week and do another live, a follow-up live, I want you to really mull all of this over and it might be that you can't do this in one sitting, it might be that you need multiple sittings or you need to digest it while you're on a walk while you're swimming, while you're exercising, while you're doing other things. So let that sink in. Journaling can be your best friend or recording your voice into a dictaphone can be your best friend. It can really help you to process all of this stuff. This is just step one. So next week, we're gonna talk about the fact that none of this is your fault. We're gonna talk about the protection trap we're going to talk about the culture trap. We're going to talk about the nature trap. And we're going to do an exercise around self-acceptance and why accepting yourself and loving yourself exactly the way that you are right now is the key to change and transformation. So that is all from me today. I would love to hear from you if any of these things worked or didn't work, that's fine. And if you need any extra help unpacking or understanding what exactly happened to you that might be causing the weight, then I might be able to help you in an RTT session, of course, but only if you are 100% committed to this work. It's really important that you are 100% committed because otherwise it's not gonna work. So RTT can be done brilliantly online via Zoom or at my home in Brighton. And it works by clearing, by finding out what this negative programming is and then clearing it through the use of the subconscious mind. It gives the most important operating system of all, your mind, a massive, massive upgrade. And most of us are walking around with adult bodies, but we've still got the child of a brain. We've still got the programming that you um, gathered when you were a child. So for those of you who don't know, RTT was designed and developed by the amazing Marissa Peer. And if you haven't heard of her, go check her out. She's amazing. And it really is taking over conventional therapy because it's rapid and it is rooted in the science of neuroplasticity. And like I said, if you haven't heard of it, you will because it is becoming a household name. So if you wanna know more, send me a direct message or send me an email, info at sallygarozzo.com or check out my website, uh, sallygarozzo.com. Okay, that's all for now. I hope you feel okay. Um, let me know if you feel a little bit discombobulated or just want a little bit of grounding. Um, I can help with that. So I will see you next week for part two, which is called It's Not Your Fault. Okay, loves. Have a great day. Bye.